Greetings. So glad to see all of you here today. We have a fascinating study. We are going to conclude our series on the 24 elders of the book of Revelation. However, before we do, we want to ask for the Lord's presence as we open His Word. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father and our God, what a joy it is to come into your presence once more with the un only intention of hearing your voice speaking to us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit as you open your Holy Word to us. Father, we realize that human wisdom is insufficient to grasp the great things of your Word. And that's why we need divine wisdom, we need divine help. And so we ask that you will come close to us through the ministry of the Spirit and the angels. And we thank you for your promise that you will be with us, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapters 24 through 27 are what some theologians have called the little apocalypse or the little book of Revelation in the Old Testament. The reason why some theologians have referred to these chapters as the little book of Revelation in the Old Testament is because these three chapters actually have a very close relationship with the last three chapters of the book of Revelation. Now I'd like to begin by having us turn in our Bibles to Isaiah 24 and I would like to read verses 1 through 4. And immediately you're going to realize that this is describing the cataclysmic global events that will take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says there in Isaiah 24 and verse 1, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with the planet, shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away, the world languishes and fades away, the haughty people of the earth languish. Now notice the strong terminology that we find in these verses. It speaks about the earth being emptied, being wasted, the inhabitants of the earth being scattered, the high and the low not escaping the destruction. The expression is used entirely emptied, utterly plundered, and it speaks about the earth mourning. Now the theologian Frederick Moriarty in the Jerome Bible Commentary, volume 1, page 277, explains exactly what this passage is describing. This is what he says, God's Word had once established order in the world, and he quotes Genesis 1, that's the creation. Then he says regarding this passage, the picture is that of a return to primeval chaos. In other words, it's a return to the condition of the earth before creation week. Now I also like to read from Isaiah 24 verses 18 through 20 towards the end of the chapter, this description of this catastrophic cataclysmic event is described with additional detail. It says in Isaiah 24 verses 18 through 20, In it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare. Kind of reminds us of Revelation chapter 6 where we're told that the wicked are going to hide in the caves and they're going to run and that they're going to cry for the rocks to fall upon them. It continues saying, For the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth are shaken. Notice a huge earthquake. Then it continues saying, the earth is violently broken. The earth shall the, the, the earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. 
the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. Once again we see strong expressions that are used in this passage. We find expressions such as, the foundations of the earth are shaken, the earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, shaken exceedingly, it shall reel to and fro, it shall totter like a hut. Now this is describing that great earthquake that will take place at the second coming of Jesus Christ, according to Isaiah chapter 16 and verses, Revelation, excuse me, chapter 16 and verses 17 through 21. Now the question is, when this cataclysmic event takes place, when Jesus comes the second time in power and glory, and the earth is emptied, and the earth is split open, and there's this gigantic earthquake, how many are going to be left as a result of this catastrophe? Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 6 has the answer. It says there, Isaiah 24 verse 6, Therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, so notice that there's fire involved in this destruction, and then it says, and few men are what? Few men are left. And so immediately the, the, the question is asked, who are the few men that are left? Now we believe as Seventh-day Adventists that when Jesus comes, all human beings on planet earth are going to be destroyed, don't we? So what is meant here when this catastrophe takes place at the second coming, what is meant by the expression, few men are left? Who are those who are left? We have to return to the time before the flood and at the flood. Go with me to Genesis chapter 7 and verses 22 and 23. Genesis chapter 7 and verses 22 and 23, and for now I want you to keep in the corner of your mind the word few. It says few men are left when this disaster or catastrophe takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now Genesis 7, 22 and 23 is speaking about the flood in Noah's day. And it says here in verse 22, speaking about God, so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing, and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Now you say, what relationship does this have with Isaiah 24 and verse 6? On the surface it doesn't appear to have any relationship because in Isaiah 24 verse 6 the word left is used. Few men are left. And here in Genesis 7, 22 and 23 the word left is not used but the word remained. It says Noah and his family remained alive. However, the Hebrew word is identical in both verses. I want you to notice how this is translated in Genesis 7 and verse 23. This is in the English Standard Version, which is one of the more contemporary versions. It's a translation, it's not a paraphrase, it's not a dynamic translation, it's a translation, full-fledged. Notice how it translates Genesis 7 and verse 23. It says there, only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. So who were left when the catastrophe of the worldwide flood came? Only Noah and his family were left or remained alive. Now is the flood symbolic of events connected with the second coming of Christ? Yes, because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Are you with me? So the question is, in Isaiah 24 and verse 6, who are the few that are left? It is not wicked people, a small group of wicked people that are left. The few that are left are the what? Are the righteous who survive this catastrophe. Now I want us to go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. 
first Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 and do you remember the word few that I told you to keep in the corner of your mind? Now notice that here Peter is speaking about the flood and he's going to refute, refer to the survivors with the same word. Notice 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse 20 speaking about the ark it says in which a few that is eight persons were brought safely through the water. So my question is who are the few that are left when Jesus comes? They are the same, the same idea as the few that were left at the time of the flood. In other words the few that are left according to Isaiah 24 and verse 6 are not the wicked, a small group of wicked people, but they represent what? The righteous who remain alive in the midst of this catastrophe. Now I want us to go back to Isaiah chapter 24 and we've noticed already that Isaiah 24 up till verse 20 is describing the cataclysmic events connected with the second coming, the catastrophe having to do with the second coming. We've noticed that there's going to be a small group of righteous people who will be left. Those are the few. But now I want you to notice something very interesting that's going to happen with the wicked. It says in Isaiah 24 and verse 21, listen carefully, this is at the second coming, it shall come to pass in that day, which day? He's been describing the second coming, right? It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. Now do you notice that there are two groups that are punished here? The first group that are punished are the high the host of the exalted ones, and the other group are the kings of the earth. Now I need to read this in a different translation because it comes through in a clearer way. In the Revised Standard Version, Isaiah 24 and verse 21 reads in this way, In that day, that is the day when this catastrophe takes place at the second coming, in that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. I like that translation. Two groups are going to be punished. The powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. So there is a heavenly group that's going to be punished and there is also an earthly group that is going to be punished. And you say, now who would the heavenly group that is going to be punished uh, in this passage? Who is it talking about? Let's go to Isaiah chapter, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 identifies the, the group that is spoken of as the powers in the heavens. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Here the Apostle Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What does he mean by flesh and blood? Human. He's talking about human beings, right? And if you want to uh, prove that point, all you have to do is go to Hebrews 2 verse 14 where it says that because the, because the uh, children had flesh and blood, Jesus also partook of the same. In other words, Jesus became a human being. So we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that is against human beings merely, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and now notice, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness, where? in heavenly places. Now let me ask you, who are those hosts, those spiritual hosts in high places that we're struggling against? They're not flesh and blood, they are what? Satan and his angels. So the question is, who are these that are described in Isaiah 24 and verse 21 as being punished because they are the powers in the heavens? It's talking about Satan and his angels. But now I want you to notice that there's another group that is punished at the second coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 19. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 19. This verse is describing the conclusion of the second coming of Christ. And I want you to notice who is going to be punished at the second coming of Christ. It says there in Revelation 19 and verse 19, And I saw the beast... And then who else? 
the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And then verse 21 says that the kings of the earth are destroyed by the sword that comes forth from the mouth of he who is seated on the white horse. In other words, they're destroyed by Christ. So what are the two groups that are punished when Jesus comes? The first group are Satan and his angels that are described in the book of Ephesians as spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The other group are described as the kings of the earth. Now the question is, what is the punishment that is given to these exalted heavenly ones and these kings of the earth? We have to go to Isaiah 24 and verse 22, and for now we'll only read the first half of the verse. Notice what the punishment is. Remember this is taking place at the second coming of Christ. There's this cataclysm, there's this catastrophe that is taking place, and there are few that are left which are the righteous, the ones that survive this catastrophe, but then there are two groups that are going to be punished at the second coming. Now. Notice Isaiah 24 and verse 22 for what the punishment is. It says there, they were be, will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. What is the punishment that takes place for the hosts on high and for the kings of the earth, the wicked? They are going to be what? They are going to become prisoners in the pit and they are going to be shut up in the prison. It says here in Isaiah 24 and verse 22. Now the question is, what is meant by the pit? Well, we need to look at other texts from scripture to find out what the pit is. Let's go to Genesis chapter 37 and verse 24. Uh, this is the same identical Hebrew word that we're going to look at now. Genesis 37 and verse 24. It's talking about the experience of Joseph. And I want you to notice what uh, they did, what his brothers did with Joseph. It says there in Genesis 37, 24, Then they took him and cast him into a, what? Into a pit. The same identical word that we find in Isaiah. And the pit was empty, there was no water in it. What was this really? It was a cistern, right? Where water was drawn to supply the needs of the people that lived nearby. And so it says here that Joseph was cast into this pit. Now let me ask you, was he alive? Yes. Did he stay there permanently? No, it was only until it could be decided what was going to be done with him. Now let's go to Isaiah 38 where this same word is used, Isaiah 38 and verse 6. This time it's talking about Jeremiah. Uh, and you know Jeremiah was thrown into the dungeon. And that word dungeon is the same word that is used in Isaiah chapter 24. It says there in Jeremiah 38 and verse 6, So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah the king's son which was in the court of the prison, and they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire, so Jeremiah sank in the mire, that is, in the mud. Now that word dungeon is the same identical word that is translated pit in Isaiah chapter 24. Now, what was this pit that Jeremiah was thrown into, this dungeon? It was actually the water well of the prison. Now let me ask you again, was Jeremiah throwing, thrown into the pit in a living state? Yes he was. Was he thrown into the pit permanently? No, he was only thrown in there until it could be decided what they were going to do with him, until a final decision was made. And so the pit can refer to a place of confinement where living individuals exist until a decision is made about what is going to happen with them. But do you know that the word pit, the same identical Hebrew word, is also used to describe people who are placed in the tomb and are prisoners of the grave. Notice Isaiah 38 and verse 18. 
Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 18. Very interesting that the pit can also refer to a place where dead people are, where deep dead people are confined in prison, so to speak. It says there in Isaiah 38 and verse 18, for Sheol, uh, some versions translate that the grave, that's the correct translation, for Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you, those who go down to the what? To the pit cannot hope for your truth. Do you see the three synonymous terms? It uses the word Sheol, which means grave, it refers to the word death cannot praise you, and then it refers to the place of confinement as the pit. So in other words, the word pit can refer to individuals who are placed in a prison in a living state until it's decided what's going to happen with them, or it can refer to individuals who are retained or kept in prison in a, in a state of death. Now why do I bring this up? I think you already know I can see some smiles on some faces here. Go with me to Revelation chapter 20 and verses 2 and 3. Is there a group that is going to be confined to a prison on this earth at the second coming in a living state? Yes or no? Who? The high and exalted ones. That's right, that we studied about. Revelation 20 verses 2 and 3. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the 24 elders? Well, we're studying the context. We'll come to the elders in a few moments. It says there, he laid hold of the dragon. Who is the dragon? The devil. That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and what did he do with him? And bound him for a thousand years. Is he going to be retained somewhere? Absolutely. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. The Greek word is abusos, in the abyss. And it says, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So the question is, is the devil placed in a living state, in a prison, at the second coming of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Now some people have wondered, what about his angels? Well, Revelation doesn't speak about the angels because in Revelation the focus is that, that the devil is fulfilling the Azazel prophecy of Leviticus 16 as the originator and instigator of sin. So the focus is on Satan who is the scapegoat of Leviticus chapter 16. But Isaiah 24 does tell us that his angels will also be retained. Because it says, the host of the high ones in heaven, host, it refers to more than one. Now here's another question, what about all of the wicked? Are the wicked going to be retained in a prison during the thousand years? Absolutely. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5, and I'm only going to read a part of this verse. Uh, if you read, for example, in the New International Version, you're going to notice that this is a, a parenthetical statement. It breaks the flow of thought with what comes before and what comes after because it's wanting to clarify what's going to happen with the rest of the dead who did not resurrect when Jesus came. Uh, in other words, with the d wicked dead who, did not, who were not raised when Jesus came on the clouds of heaven. It says in Revelation 20 verse 5, but the rest of the dead, that is those who were not taken to heaven with with Christ when he came to resurrect the righteous dead, but the rest of the dead did not live again until when? Until the thousand years were finished. What's going to happen with all of the wicked during the thousand years? They are going to be contained in the tomb. They are going to be dead. They're also going to be in the pit, but they're going to be in the pit dead. Whereas the devil and his angels are going to be in the pit how? alive. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now let's go to Isaiah 24 and verse 22, and I know you might have questions and at the end we're, we're going to allow you a chance to ask questions in case something isn't absolutely clear. Isaiah 24 and verse 22, are we doing well so far? So we have the second coming of Christ, terrible catastrophe, few individuals are left, that's the righteous, at that time two groups are going to be punished. One group are 
the wicked angels, Satan and his angels, the other group are those who live upon the earth, they're described as the kings of the earth. The high and exalted ones are going to be placed as prisoners in the pit on planet earth during a thousand years in a living state, whereas all of the wicked will also be in the pit, so to speak, but they will be dead. Now the question is, how long are they going to remain in the pit? How long are they going to remain in this prison? Isaiah 24 and verse 22, the last part of the verse has the answer. And I'm going to read the first part of the verse again so that we have the context. It says, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison, and now notice, after what? After many days they will be what? Punished. Now that's interesting. I thought we already read that they were punished once when Jesus came. Now it says after many days they will be punished. How many stages to the punishment of the exalted ones and the kings of the earth? How many stages? Two stages. The first stage is when they're placed in the prison or in the pit. Many days go by and then comes their final stage of punishment. Are you clear? Now the big question is, how long are the many days? I think you have the answer. Revelation chapter 20 tells us how long that period is. The many days are equivalent to how long? They are equivalent to a thousand years. Incidentally, do you know that here we have proof for what is known as the year day principle? <laughs> because in Isaiah it says many days, but that's interpreted in Revelation as a thousand years. Days are equivalent to years. So as you compare these two passages you have the year day principle as you compare Isaiah 24 with Revelation chapter 20. Now let's talk about what happens at the end of the thousand years, after the many days when they're shut up in prison. First of all, Revelation 21 and verse 2, if you go with me there, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2 tells about the descent of the holy city. And then let me ask you, are the wicked going to resurrect after the thousand years? Yes, because we read in Revelation 20 verse 5 that the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So are they going to resurrect at the end of the thousand years? Of course they are. Now I want you to notice Revelation 21 verse 12 the new Jerusalem descends. It says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So the holy city comes down. And I want you to notice something very interesting about the holy city. Notice Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 23. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 23. Keep one finger in Isaiah 24 and keep another finger in Revelation because we're going to go back and forth. Isaiah 24 and verse 23 says something very interesting about the sun and the moon. It says there, then the moon will be disgraced. This is after the many days according to the context. Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will what? Will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before His elders gloriously. Now what I want you to notice here is what's going to happen with the sun and the moon when the holy city descends. It says that the moon will be disgraced and the sun will be ashamed. Now you say, is there any relationship between this text and the book of Revelation? Absolutely. I want you to see that Revelation amplifies Isaiah 24. Notice Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23. Revelation 21 and verse 23. It's speaking about the New Jerusalem. And it says, the city had what? No need of what? Else? Of, what? of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Now, let me ask you, is there going to be sun and moon in the new earth? Of course, because there's going to be months. We're going to eat from the tree of life from new moon to new moon, and the month is determined by the new moon. 
Now if there's months, are there going to be weeks and days? Of course, because we're going to keep the seventh day Sabbath, according to Isaiah chapter 66. And so I want you to notice that there is going to be sun and there is going to be moon. And so people say, but wait a minute, this must mean that there is not going to be any, any weekly or monthly cycle because it says there's not going to be any sun or moon. That's not what the text says. The text, if we read it carefully, says the city had no need, we have to read carefully, had no need of sun or the moon to shine in it. Let me give you a, an illustration. Let's supposing that it's high noon, July in Fresno. You know what the sun shines like here, right? And you go outside and you have a flashlight in your hand and you're shining the flashlight on the ground. Is the light of the flashlight on? Yes. Can you see it? No. Why? Because the brightness of the sun, of the sun outshines the brightness of the flashlight. There will be sun and moon, but the glory in the city will be so great that it's like the sun and the moon are not there. That's why Isaiah says, the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Now we still have to talk about what's going to happen with the kings of the earth and with Satan and his angels after the thousand years. We're told that after the thousand years, after the many days, they are going to be punished. Now let's notice Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 9 to see if there's going to be a punishment of both groups. If the final punishment is after the thousand years. Revelation 20 verses 7 through 9. Now when the thousand years have expired, is that the many days, yes or no? When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Oh, okay, so, not, so he must have been in prison during the many days, right? Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive what? The nations. Have the nations been released from the grave as well? Absolutely, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And now notice the final punishment after the many days. It says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and what? Out of heaven and devoured them. Are you understanding this message? Now, let's talk a little bit about life after the destruction of the wicked and what it's going to be like. In a moment we're going to get to the 24 elders. But I want you to notice Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. What happens after the destruction of the host of the high winds and the kings of the earth? Now I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. So notice now, after the destruction of these two groups, there's a new heavens and a new earth. And then notice Revelation 21 and verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more pain, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more death, for the former things have passed away. Now, if you're still wondering whether there's a connection between Revelation 20 and 21 and the book of Isaiah, that idea will be dissipated. Because this verse comes from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 25, the little apocalypse or the little book of Revelation. It says there in Isaiah 25 and verse 8, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of His people He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So is there a relationship between Isaiah 24 and Revelation 20 and 21? I'm only giving you a couple of examples. You know, we could go, let's just go for a moment uh, to Isaiah chapter 24. And I want you to notice uh, chapter, actually let's go to chapter 27 and let's read verse 1. This is speaking about after the thousand years, after the many days. Notice what God is going to do. In that day, the Lord with His severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeting what? The fleeting serpent. 
Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay, and unfortunately the New King James Version translates, he will slay the reptile. You know that's not a good translation. The King James has it right here. The King James says, and he will slay what? He will slay, slay the dragon that is in the sea. Who is that dragon who's going to be slain or who's going to be destroyed? It's Satan, and this is referring to after the thousand years. Now let's go to Isaiah 24 and tw verse 23 and take a look at a group that are spoken of there as the elders above which God will rule when He creates a new heavens and a new earth. It says there in Isaiah 24 and verse 23, Then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed, and this is speaking after God creates a new heavens and a new earth, and the holy city has descended. For the Lord of hosts will what? Will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem, according to Revelation chapter 21. And then what does it say? And before his what? Before his elders gloriously. Who is God going to rule according to this before? He's going, to, he's going to rule before His what? Before His elders. Now it's interesting that when everything is done and finished, God is going to rule over His elders, the heavenly council, in the same way that He did from the very beginning when Lucifer sinned in the days of Job, in the experience in 1 Chronicles, and successively throughout the history of the world. You see, God governs the universe through representatives from every planet in the universe. Now somebody might say, well Pastor Bohr, um, are the 24 elders really just 24 worlds? The answer is no. We're dealing here with a symbolic number, just like in Revelation you find numbers that are symbolic. Let me read you a statement from Review and Herald, September 25, 1900, where Ellen White describes the number of worlds in God's universe. She says this, God has worlds upon worlds that are obedient to His law. These worlds are conducted with reference to the glory of the Creator. As the inhabitants of these worlds see the great price that has been paid to ransom man, they are filled with amazement. With the intense interest they watch the controversy between Christ and Satan, and as this controversy progresses and the glory of God shines brighter and brighter, they give praise to God. God has what? Worlds upon worlds that are obedient to His law. Now I'd like to read you a statement that we find in the book Counsels to the Church pages 240 and 241. Do you know that the organizational system that the church has on earth is really a reflection of the organizational system that God has in heaven? So if you see how the church is organized on earth, you will have a general idea about how God operates the universe. Now notice this very interesting passage. Ellen White states, the church of God below is one with the church above. Believers on the earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen constitute one church. Every heavenly intelligence is interested in the assemblies of the saints who on earth meet to worship God. In the inner court of heaven they listen to the testimony of the witnesses for Christ in the outer court on earth. And the praise and thanksgiving from the worshipers below is taken up in heavenly anthem and praise and rejoicing sound through the heavenly courts because Christ has not died in vain for the fallen sons of Adam. While angels drink from the fountainhead, the saints on earth drink of the pure streams flowing from the throne, the streams that make glad the city of God. Let me ask you, was the earthly sanctuary a reflection of the heavenly sanctuary? Was the earthly priesthood illustrative of the priesthood of Christ? 
were the ceremonies of the sanctuary illustrative of the ceremonies that Jesus was to carry on in heaven? Absolutely. Was the earthly city of Jerusalem an earthly copy of the heavenly Jerusalem? We could get into that. Absolutely. So in other words, God's organizational system on earth is actually a reflection or a copy of how God in heaven operates the universe. Now let me ask you, does God have different ranks of beings in heaven? Yes. There are Michael, the archangel, who is Christ, cherubim, seraphim, what Ellen White calls tall commanding angels, strong angels, highest angels. In other words, there are different ranks and orders of being in heaven, each in the chain of command. Notice Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. There are several categories of leadership that are mentioned here. Colossians 1 and verse 16. Speaking about Christ, who was the creator of all, it says, For by Him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, and now notice the categories, whether thrones, or what? Or dominions, or what? Or principalities, or powers. Now somebody might be saying, well, Pastor Boar, this is probably talking about uh, the wicked thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. Not so. Notice Desire of Ages, page 834. When Christ ascends to heaven and enters through the gates into the city to go into the holy place, where all heaven is waiting for His arrival, we find this statement, with joy unutterable, rulers and principalities and powers acknowledge the supremacy of the Prince of Life. And so does God have different ranks of beings in heaven? He most certainly does. Incidentally, do you know that the devil also has copied the same ranks in his organizational system? You say, how do you know that? Well, go with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. We find once again these same words, but they're applied to the wicked, to the wicked leaders of the hosts of spiritual darkness here on earth, the devil and his angels. It says in Ephesians 6 verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Notice again, principalities, powers, and what? And rulers. Notice also Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, two of these uh, names are used to describe uh, those who are in the ranks of Satan. Colossians 2 and verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, that is, in his cross. So does the devil have a similar organizational system to what God has? Absolutely he does, because the devil was once an exalted angel in heaven. He knows what the heavenly sanctuary looked like. He knows what the new Jerusalem looked like. He knows how God operated the universe. And so he says, if it works up there, it's certainly going to work down here. Now, what would be the equivalent of the representatives of the worlds that rule over those worlds and represent those worlds and oversee those worlds, what would the equivalent be in the earthly structure? How about the elders? Go with me to Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus, his pupil, and he tells Titus that he has to do something. Every city that he goes to, he has to do something. It says there in verse 5 of Titus 1, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should what? Set in order the things that are lacking. There, evidently there was an order there in the church. And how was this going to take place? How was it going to be ordered? And appoint what? Elders in every city as I commanded you. Now let me ask you, what was the role of these elders? We'll come back to that in a few moments. But the role of these elders was to represent their churches. The role of these elders was to rule or govern over the churches. 
the rule of uh, the, 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 the role of these elders was for them to oversee the functioning of God's work in that specific church. Now let me go for a moment, before we go and prove this from the New Testament, I want to go to the Old Testament to Numbers 11 verses 16 and 17 where it speaks about the 70 elders. Have you ever heard of the 70 elders that Moses established? I want you to notice that they were leaders, that they were rulers, they were overseers, and they were representatives of their tribes. It says there in Numbers 11 verse 16, So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people, and what? Officers over them. Did they rule over them? Most certainly. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the Spirit that is upon you, and I will put the same upon them. Are they ordained with the Spirit for their function? Yes. And notice, and they shall bear the what? They shall bear the, bear the burden of the people. Is this an administrative post? Yes, the burden of the people that you may not bear it yourself alone. It's interesting to notice Ellen White's comment in Acts of the Apostles, page 94. She speaks about these elders and she says the following, Later, when choosing 70 elders to share with him the responsibilities of leadership, Moses was careful to select as his helpers men possessing dignity, sound judgment, and experience. In his charge to these elders, listen carefully, at the time of their ordination, were they ordained, the 70 elders? Absolutely. Did they receive the Spirit? We already read it. And so it says, in his charge to these elders at the time of their ordination, he outlined, now does that uh, pattern back there also apply to the organizational structure of the church? She says, in his charge to these elders at the time of their ordination, he outlined some of the qualifications that fit a man to be a wise ruler in the church. Are you with me? Now let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, and we really have to motor now because the clock is the greatest enemy we have. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, notice what the Apostle Paul has to say. Let the elders, and if you read the previous verse it's talking about the elders of the church, that's the context. Let the elders who what? What's the next word? Who rule well. Oh, who rule. So they're rulers. Are the 24 elders rulers? Do they sit on thrones? Do they have, do they have crowns on their heads? Absolutely. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. Once again, it's speaking about the elders. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. Here the Apostle Paul says that the bishop or overseer, interesting, the word bishop means overseer, the bishop or overseer must be one who what? There it is again. Who rules his own house well, having his children in what? In submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he what? Take care of the church of God. Are you understanding the role of the elder on earth? Is that the same type of role that the elders play in heaven? Absolutely. And you know what? The elders in the New Testament were representatives of their churches when a general council was celebrated on earth. Notice Acts chapter 15 and verse 6, it's speaking about the first general council of the church. This was in the year 49 AD. It was celebrated in Jerusalem. And I want you to notice who were the ones who gathered there to make the decision about whether the Gentiles should be circumcised or not. See the church is dealing with this thorny issue of circumcision, so who's going to decide? Is it decided by Peter who's sitting there and he's the Pope and he says, I declare no more circumcision. No, it's decided in a council with representatives, elder representatives from all over the empire. Notice Acts 15 and verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to do what? To consider 
this matter. And then let's go to Acts chapter 16 verses 4 and 5. We don't have time to study everything concerning the Jerusalem council. But I want you to notice that once the decision was made in the council, everybody had to abide by it. It went, the decision went to all of the churches. It says in Acts 16, 4 and 5, and as they went through the cities, this is uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, as they went through the cities, they delivered to them, that is to the churches in those cities, the decrees to keep, which were determined by whom? By the apostles and who else? And the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Question. Do the elders gather in a general council to make decisions concerning the welfare of the entire church? Absolutely. Is that the true also of the elders in God's heavenly kingdom? They represent planets and they come to deliberate regarding the well-being of the entire universe? Absolutely. Now notice how Ellen White comments about this in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 95. She says, the order that was maintained in the early Christian church made it possible for them to move forward solidly as well as a well-disciplined army clad with the armor of God. The companies of believers, though scattered over a large territory, were all members of one body, all moved in concert and in harmony with one another. When dissension arose in a local church, as later it did arise in Antioch and elsewhere, and the believers were unable to come to an agreement among themselves, such matters were not permitted to create a division in the church, but were referred to a general council of the entire body of believers, made up of appointed delegates from the various local churches, with the apostles and elders in positions of leading responsibility. Thus, the efforts of Satan to attack the church in isolated places were met by concerted action on the part of all and the plans of the enemy to disrupt and destroy were thwarted. Are you catching a picture? So what is the role of the 24 elders? Remember it's a symbolic number. What is the role of the representatives of the worlds? They rule over those worlds. They oversee those worlds. They represent those worlds before the heavenly council. Do you remember that we noticed when Lucifer sinned, what did God do? God could have sat on his throne and he could have said, oh this individual uh, has uh, violated my law, he's rebellious, uh, throw him out. But according to the spirit of prophecy, God gathered the heavenly council. And he said, okay folks, this is what we have. This is the problem that has come up in the universe. Now what do you suppose we're supposed to do? The Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the heavenly council said to God, expel him from heaven. Interesting that God cares what his creatures, uh, how his creatures see him. In other words, God runs a representative style of government. Interesting. God is a God of democracy. Now could God do it all by himself if he wanted to? Of course he could. But God cares to involve all of the beings in his entire universe and has delegated the responsibility to represent in the heavenly council every planet in his vast universe when decisions are made that affect not only a local situation but that affect the entirety of the universe. Let me ask you, would the rebellion of Satan in heaven cause turmoil for all of the universe or was it just a localized problem in the presence of God? Listen, if it was not handled, it would eventually have infected the whole universe. And so God gathered the heavenly council together. Now, summarizing then, the elders on earth give us a pattern so that we can understand the roles of the elders in heaven. The elders are rulers and overseers. The elders are representatives of different planets, as the elders on earth are representatives of individual churches. The elders deliberate in a council, and the elders are administrators of their section of the church. They are officers, as Ellen White says many times in her writings.
So do the elders have a very important function in God's administration of the universe? They most certainly do. And you know, it's really nice that someday, as I was mentioning before, we'll be able to travel to all of these worlds. And we'll be able to meet the representatives from those worlds. And we'll be able to talk to those representatives of the worlds. And as we also studied, Adam will be reinstated in his first dominion. He will represent planet Earth in the heavenly council. Isn't it marvelous the way that God operates his universe? You know, God could do it all himself, but God gives different gifts in the church to make sure that the church functions in perfect harmony and in perfect unity. What a wonderful and marvelous God we have. And so, in conclusion, the 24 elders are powerful, strong, the highest of angels that have been placed in different worlds to oversee and rule those worlds and represent those worlds before the heavenly council. And someday we will have the privilege of meeting them and will become acquainted with them and will be able to ask them undoubtedly many questions about history and how it transpired and how God was vindicated before all of the beings of his universe. What a wonderful and marvelous God we have. Let's make sure that we don't miss the boat and that we are there.